Well, thank you guys. It's it's kind of weird to do this virtually, but it's it's good to be with you. It's been a few years, as, as uh, Alan mentioned, since I've been to Idaho. Um, I actually went to BYU, so when I went to college, I wasn't too far away. Uh, but it's it's great to be with you guys again. So a couple of things uh, as we get started here. Um, just quick show of hands in the room there. How many of you know who I am or have seen any of the work that I've done before? So I have an idea. Okay, so some of you, some of you have not great. This is a, a good chance for you to, to find out a little bit about what we're doing. And I'll, I'll talk about that. I really wanna spend um, a lot of this conversation, make it into a conversation to talk with you all, take questions and kind of respond to what's happening because there's so much going on right now in the world and certainly in the world of media. Uh, it's it's funny to me because as Alan and Elizabeth can tell you, I've been waving the flag on this for years, right? Warning about how corrupt media is, how biased uh, media is, how things have got to change. Um, warning about social media and what was going to happen with it. There were people saying that I was nuts for saying that social media was going to start purging and removing content creators uh, a few years ago. And sure enough, of course, we saw in 2020 this massive uh, kind of purge and removal uh, going on. And I'll talk about why some of that happened. But let me just start with this. So so my name is Ben Swan. I'm a trained journalist, reporter, anchor, host. Uh, I've been doing this now for over 20 years. I started out as a news videographer, uh, working for a local TV station in my hometown of El Paso, Texas, and you know, wound up, I actually wanted to be a, a pastor. That's what my intention in life was. Um, I was doing that since I was 15, working in, in ministry. And uh, took a break, left TV, and went and, and got into full-time ministry. I did that for a couple of years and then decided because I had my first daughter and my second daughter was on the way, my wife and I were moving from Oregon back to Texas at the time. And I said, I, I got to do something more to support my family because ministry, as much as I love doing it, doesn't pay well. Um, and so I got back into TV, stayed in ministry, by the way, for 20 years. Uh, I spent a total of, of 20 years doing full-time ministry or part-time ministry of some kind. Uh, but did that and then went into TV and I went as a, a videographer and a news photographer. I did that for a couple of years and then transitioned over to in front of the screen, became a reporter. Uh, the first nearly 10 years of my career, um, quite honestly, uh, doesn't have a whole lot of accolades to it in terms of anything that I would say, hey, I'm really proud of this work, except for a couple of things. Uh, early on in my career, I had the chance to cover in the state of New Mexico, um, this issue of child abuse resulting in death. There, were, there was a, a whole series of kids who were being killed by their parents because of child abuse. In New Mexico at the time, the law stated that you, if you murdered your child, like you went into their room and choked them to death or beat them to death in one setting, you, you, know, you would receive a, a capital sentence, life in prison. Um, but the law stated that if you abused your child to the point of death, meaning that I, did, I came in one day and I beat that child senseless and I left and the child was still alive. And I came back the next day and did it again. I came back the next day and did it again. And after several days or weeks of this or months of this, the child ultimately died. That was called child abuse resulting in death. And you got about 10 to 12 years. And if you had behaved well in prison with good time added into it, most people were doing anywhere from six to eight years as a prison sentence. And as a young reporter, I, I saw this was happening, covered a couple of high profile cases, and then started working to get the laws changed by covering activists who were trying to change the law in New Mexico and what was happening. And, and I, that was kind of my first experience with uh, corruption in government, seeing how government responds or doesn't respond. Even when something is so clearly in front of you that it needs to be changed, it's very difficult to get things to, to change. Uh, Bill Richardson was governor of New Mexico at the time, and, and that was my, also my first experience with going and putting a camera in a politician's face and saying, you said you were going to do something, you didn't do it, why haven't you done it? And seeing the results of that being a, a quick turnaround and, and the law changed. So uh, there was a lot that I learned from that. But other than that happening, the first almost 10 years of my on-air TV career was pretty lackluster. I won a bunch of awards and Emmy awards and, and Edward R. Murrow awards because I was a good reporter, but I wasn't necessarily doing anything that, that bucked the system. I didn't even realize there was a system to buck. And then I, in, in 2010, I moved from El Paso covering the drug war and I started covering the drug war in 2008. And from 2008 to 2010 in, in uh, Ciudad Juarez across the river from El Paso, I, I spent 
a uh, couple of years going over into Mexico and covering the cartels and the drug war there. Most exciting time of my life in terms of what I was doing professionally. Uh, but that was my first experience with realizing how corrupt media was, because as I was covering what was going on in Juarez and the drug war that was taking place there, the, the networks, I was working for NBC at the time, the networks were coming down and they were kind of covering what was happening and they were telling a very different story. They, they were telling the story as if, and I'm sure this won't be shocking to you now, they had this preconceived uh, narrative in mind, a story that they were going to tell regardless of what was actually happening. And so I started contacting the producers and the reporters who were coming from the network and saying, hey, listen, every day I drive across the river, every day I'm in there, we're, we're driving across and seeing you know, decapitated bodies hanging from overpasses and we're, and we're witnessing horrific murders. At the time, Juarez was the most violent city in the world, more so than, than Baghdad. It was the most deadly city in the world for journalists. And so covering what was going on there and seeing what was happening there, I started letting you know, these, these guys know and they had no interest in it. And so that was kind of shocking to me. And it was kind of my first experience of realizing that, that in certain places in media, certain levels of media, there was not an interest in seeking truth. There was an interest in telling a story based upon a narrative and a narrative that fit with what they wanted it to fit with. So um, I did a couple of years of that. And then my, my wife got tired of this and said, you're going to get killed. We al I was almost kidnapped one time. Uh, it's a whole story. And she said, we got to leave. And I had an offer to go to from the most violent, exciting coverage that I had ever done in my life to the most boring city in the world, Cincinnati, Ohio. And so literally, we moved from from El Paso to Cincinnati. And I went and became the anchor of a Fox station uh, in Cincinnati. And when I say it's the most boring city, listen, nothing against Cincinnati. I love Cincinnati. Uh, my family had a great experience there for five years, but it was not an exciting place to be. It was like very boring content, you know, um, and then I had the opportunity to start doing, doing work on political issues, because what I didn't know coming from Texas is that when you move to Ohio, especially at the time in 2010, 2011, 2012, Ohio was the swing state of swing states. And so every single presidential candidate came through Ohio and wanted to be there uh, and be interviewed. And so I got a chance to interview every single person running on the Republican side. I had a chance to interview a sitting president, Barack Obama at the time. And, and my opportunity to really confront them with real questions about what, what's going on in the world um, was met with a lot of fanfare, uh, got a lot of good press out of it, and I got a lot of bad press out of it. It was very interesting. And, and most of the, the bad response I got from it came from my bosses that I was working for at the time in Cincinnati. Did not like the questions I would ask. I had a chance to interview President Obama at the time, and I asked him about his kill list, asked him about Al-Qaeda uh, in Syria, which at the time was considered a crazy idea. He says so in the interview. There's no Al-Qaeda in Syria. Well, absolutely. Now, of course, we know Al-Qaeda was in Syria. Uh, the fact that we were funding Al-Qaeda, which at the time seemed blasphemous. How could you ever say that the United States would fund Al-Qaeda? Of course, now we know we were funding Al-Qaeda. We still are funding Al-Qaeda in many places in the world. Um, and so, uh, you know, began to, to build a huge online following. And so in 2014, I started something called the Truth and Media Project. And my idea was, at the time, I'm going to start this project. In fact, this is about the time that I was in Idaho for the first time, was around 2014, right? And so I did this thing called Truth and Media Project. And the idea was there is content out there that's, that's not being shared with the public, news stories and information that, that people aren't getting. And so how do we get that information out to the public? Um, and so what we need to do is create content, create online content. And I saw this, this world of streaming that was coming along and said, yeah, th this is where it needs to be, where, where networks can't control it. And, and we can get this content onto cable and we get it onto streaming networks. What I didn't realize at the time was that the world of streaming at the top, the world of social media at the top was all about to shift and to change. And so from 2014 to 2016, I had a tremendous success building online content, uh, putting content on, on Facebook. We were doing about 150 million video views each year at that time on Facebook. Facebook video was very good for us. Uh, and there was a lot of great content. I wound up leaving uh, we're not leaving to continue to do that, but left Cincinnati and moved to Atlanta and became the anchor of a CBS station in Atlanta during that time. And, and from 2015 until 2018, 
I was working for CBS in Atlanta. We brought a segment with us called Reality Check, and we covered all these different issues of what was going on in the presidential election, what was going on uh, around the world in terms of Syria. At the time, the Syrian civil war was, was pretty uh, hot and heavy, and the media was very clearly taken aside. And so I covered that extensively. Um, and then at the end of, of 2017, going into 2018, I did a, a report on something called Pizzagate. You've probably heard of it. Uh, and, and my report was essentially this, that there was a guy who walked into Comet Ping Pong Pizza in Washington, D.C. with a rifle. Every news network was covering it. Our station in Atlanta, a CBS station, was covering the fact that this guy went in with a gun to confront and find out about this crazy conspiracy theory. Look at what conspiracy theorists are doing. This came from Macedonian sheep farmers who created this theory that Hillary Clinton eats children in the basement of a, of a um, pizza parlor. And so I had thousands of people reaching out to me saying, can you look into this story? Can you look at what's actually going on? Because what's being said about it is not, is not true. And so I did, I looked into it and realized that in fact, that's correct. That the information that was going out about this story was untrue. And that this idea that it came from Macedonian sheep farmers was a lie. It actually came from John Podesta's emails that the concept was not that Hillary Clinton was eating children. It was that there are people in high levels within her campaign who exhibit the behavior of pedophiles or use pedophile coded language in their emails. By the way, that is true. Now, it doesn't mean you're a pedophile just because you use language that also happens to be used by pedophiles. Um, you know, those of you who know the phrase correlation does not equal causation, correlation does not equal causation. What's fascinating about the Pizzagate story is that it wasn't a bunch of conspiracy theorists who actually started this. It was a bunch of pedophiles who did. It was pedophiles on the 4chan web forum who were the first ones to say, by the way, has anyone noticed that in these WikiLeaks released emails from John Podesta that he's using language that we use, which is pretty fascinating. Anyways, we could talk all day about, about that. The bottom line is I did, I did a report on it. Um, I, I think it's still online, by the way, you can see it for yourself. I think it was a very fair report and it didn't go near as far as we could have gone. Um, but as a result of that, I also had this encounter where for the first time, I realized the social media censor censorship was really coming because this was at the end of 2017 going into 2018. And my bosses came to me and said they were gonna fire me for doing this story. I said, you can do that if you want to. I'm gonna sue you if you do because Every single manager, news manager in the room literally signed off on this report. They read the scripts ahead of time. They agreed that it was solid. That it was a solid story. Uh, and so then they turned around and said, okay, we've decided we're not gonna fire you. But what we are gonna do is we're going to ban you from social media. And I thought that was pretty weird. And so they banned me from social media for a year. And what's fascinating in my mind about that, looking back on it is for the first time I realized like, okay, so this guy who you're saying did this thing that's, bad, but it's not necessarily bad because you did sign off on it, but you, should, you shouldn't have done it in the first place, right? And so they have, they're kind of playing along with this narrative, can still be the face of our station in, in Atlanta. There are still billboards of me in Atlanta at the time as you're driving down the street saying, this is our anchor, right? Still the guy you're promoting, but he can't be on social media. Why? It was a very weird concept. And what I began to realize over the course of that year was, there is something coming. There is something on its way where there is a recognition that I could spend every single night on that, that, the eighth largest TV market in the country. Every night I can be anchoring news there. But if they can take away social media where people are truly influenced, that's what their concern is. And so for a year I was off um, of social media and then I had an opportunity through cryptocurrency called Dash to come back and to bring back my reporting. So I went back to my bosses, said, hey, I'm under contract. And part of my contract says I have the right to do this. I'm going to exercise that clause in my contract. And I'm going to continue to put stuff on social media. And they said, okay, we need to talk about it. Go home. We'll talk about it tomorrow. And then when I went home, they called me from home and said, you're fired. I said, okay, fine. So they, they dropped me from doing that. But uh, I spent a year working with this cryptocurrency called Dash and began to learn about the, the blockchain world and how blockchain works and this concept of something called decentralization, which was a fascinating concept, knew nothing about it at the time. And I spent a year understanding it with them and then began to work independently and create a lot of content. 
and saw what was coming in terms of this big purge that was on its way. And so began to, I began to think about two and a half years ago now, how do we build a, a, a platform, a place for content creators, because the purge is coming, that will be protected from big tech? And so I had these kind of initial thoughts and I started working with the team and we started kind of drafting what this would look like and how to create something that would be kind of bulletproof. And we spent two and a half years doing that. Well, last year in 2020, when the pandemic hit and all of a sudden there was, you know, a shutdown of everything and this massive purge took place of information. It's not just people, but information purge began to take place. We said, hey, we've, we've had this plan in mind and we can't just sit around and think about this anymore. Now we've got to build it. So we ran a WeFunder campaign and we raised about half a million dollars through WeFunder and we've started building it. And, and I would say that, you know, that's taken a few months to work with the developers who were developing the site and building it out. Um, and then this September, mid to late September of this year, we'll actually be launching this platform. And what's really interesting about it is it is the first ever platform that will combine top content creators. It will be built entirely on the blockchain, meaning we have no centralized servers. Nobody can take our servers down like they did to Parler when GoDaddy took down uh, the Parler servers, when, when Amazon pressured hosting companies to stop hosting uh, Parler, or when Google and Apple removed them from their Play Store. All those little tricks, all those little steps that big tech has taken to be able to completely dominate and control the media space they won't be able to use on us. We're building uh, web native apps that will never live on the app stores. Therefore, we're not subject to what the app store is trying to do. Uh, we have our DNS is protected. It's built on the blockchain so that you can't cut off access to our DNS. A lot of technical speak here, but suffice to say, we are building an uncensorable uh, blockchain-based platform that will launch later this year. And we're bringing on some big name content creators who are, we're already signing agreements with who are gonna join our platform. I, I'm excited uh, to do it when it comes out. We'll, we'll send you guys information and hopefully Alan and Elizabeth can share it with everyone so you guys can get on board with it. Um, but the reason this is so important, I don't even need to make the case, we can talk about it. But look, everything that's been going on this year is absolutely insane. And, and a year ago, you know, I did a couple of reports that were being censored. I talked about masks and the fact that masks don't work in preventing the spread of COVID, right? That's not my opinion. That's absolutely proven by a decade's worth of scientific studies. Of course, I'm told that I'm a liar. YouTube takes my content and removes it. Facebook removes my content. I, they're all taking it down and saying, you can't talk about this stuff here because you're, it's misinformation. They've got these fact checkers who are now fact checking everyone. You go to the source of what the fact checker is getting their information from and it's some garbage you know, um, letter that's written or some article that they're using as a fact check. Like a, a fact checker never uses an article for a fact check. You go back to source documentation. And so we've watched all this happen. You guys know. You know what's happening right now. Hydroxychloroquine is in the news right now, right? Because for a year, we were told that because Trump said hydroxychloroquine would work, that clearly it was dangerous and it was incredibly dangerous for the public to use this and people could die if they took it. And now we know that it actually increases survival rates by 200% if someone gets COVID. And now the latest, the latest thing that we're facing, well, and of course we have the lab leak, we don't even need to spend a whole lot of time on that, right? I've been talking for over a year, proving that the US was funding gain-of-function research. It isn't even hard to prove. I've got so much documentation that I've put online and, and made uh, reports about that clearly this was happening. Uh, it, it wasn't hidden at all. And yet Fauci keeps getting up in line in front of Congress with no punishment saying it's not true. Now we know it's true. And now the, the latest scandal that has come out, of course, is the CDC is holding an emergency meeting next week because according to Israeli doctors and Israeli scientists, there's a, there are 800 young men who have heart uh, inflammatory conditions as a result of getting the vaccine. Exactly what we thought was the case, right? Why do you not mandate and why is it illegal according to the Nuremberg trials? Why is it illegal according to international law to force people to take an experimental medication or an experimental vaccine because you're testing on them and you cannot mandate people to be tested on. And yet we know this is happening. And just yesterday, YouTube and Facebook began purging any content that questions this while the CDC is set to hold an emergency meeting next week to look at the fact that both Germany and Israel have come out and said, we, according to what we've studied, 
there are young children, teenagers, and young men especially, who are having heart problems as a result of this vaccine, and yet it's still being purged. So the media goes along with it, mainstream, social media, it's, it's all a mess right now. The good news is, before I take questions, I'll say this, the good news is that we are living in a moment where if two or three or five years ago, I said to you, hey, I wanna build a, a platform that competes with Facebook and YouTube and Instagram and Twitter, and we're gonna build something that competes with them. You would have said to me, why? What's the point? Or, or maybe not you specifically, because you guys are a little smarter than a lot of folks, but, but most people would have said, why? What's the point of doing that? Twitter's fine. YouTube's fine. That's where all the people are, right? Why would you ever need to do that? But now in the moment that we're in right now, there's virtually no one who even asks that question anymore. They, the question they ask now is how long until it's ready, right? How long do we have to wait before we get to see this thing? Because everyone's waiting on it. The world is waiting on this. And the reality is that in a, in a free market society, which we are not, but in a free market society, the market has to be the answer. And Facebook, there was no market space to be able to compete with Facebook or YouTube or Twitter or Google or Amazon. There's no market space to compete against them until they amazingly and miraculously created the market opportunity, the opportunity for someone to be able to compete with them. And they've done it on their own. That's why they, that's why they destroyed Parler and took Parler down uh, was because they saw a, comp a competitor there who they thought actually could take some of their market share. The difference between us and Parler is Parler depended on their technology. We're building separate from it. And with that, I'll take any questions that you have. And hopefully I can hear you guys because it sounds so quiet. Ben? Yes, can you hear me? I can. One of the things I wanted to ask you about for the students is that Alan and I saw a, a video called uh, Social Dilemma. And I didn't know whether you saw it, but yes. you were talking about the different platforms we've been talking about this for some time. Do you also mention fact checking? And I wonder if you would, if you could go into that because they maintain that the fact checking uh, is being done through Google or something, they know what you already think and they feed you. That's what these young people found out and that's why they quit. They found out they're gonna keep us divided by saying, if you take this position, they're gonna feed you that kind of facts and the other. Could you address that for a minute, please? Yeah, absolutely. So, so there is a lot of uh, what's built into these AI systems, artificial intelligence algorithms that Google is using, Facebook uses it. Google uses it more than anybody else right now, but Facebook is using it as well. That is a bit different than the fact checking. It's, it's kind of two entities that have found uh, kind of a, a commonality in usefulness. And so what Google does is yes, they are feeding to you specifically based on your likes, your interests, your geography, your personal demographics, your gender, your age, all those things, right? And they're feeding content to you that they believe will influence you in certain ways. So we know that during the 2020 election that Google was specifically targeting uh, groups of people with advertisements specific to get them to go out and vote and specifically to vote for Biden, right? They were, they were targeting um, information, not advertising. They were targeting information that way. They were limiting what you could find through your Google search based on your physical location, based on your interests. So it was very manipulative in that process. What's different about the fact-checking side of it though, and this is pretty interesting to me as a journalist, is that the fact-checking has been outsourced. So it's not internal within Google. It's not internal within Twitter or within Facebook. They are outsourced to, to, to companies like USA Today. Gannett owns USA Today. So USA Today is one of the, the preeminent fact checkers online. Uh, PolitiFact is a preeminent fact checker online. And so these companies, what they'll do is they receive tens of millions of dollars in grants essentially from Google and from Facebook to conduct this research. And then what they do is they act on behalf of some special interest to, to control information. So a lot of the fact checking organizations take money from the Gates Foundation, right? And so when you start to cover the fact that Bill Gates, for instance, you know, a decade ago, about 12 years ago, actually, 
uh, was kicked out of India, right? His Gates Foundation was actually kicked out of India because they were in India giving experimental vaccines to young girls. They claimed they were giving those girls HPV shots. They weren't. They were giving them an experimental vaccine that wound up sterilizing many of them, 700,000 girls, or had some kind of, of um, health defect associated with it. There was a huge inquiry that was held by the Indian parliament and they voted to expel the Gates Foundation from the country of India. Now, most of you may or may not have known that. I didn't know that until very recently. What's interesting is if you go and you look for it online, that's all been scrubbed from, from online. In order to find out about it, you have to actually go talk to people who were in the Indian parliament at the time. A friend of mine, Mickey Willis, actually interviewed these guys in the movie Plandemic, if you've seen it. And they talk about the fact that, that Gates was, was kicked out of the country, but in the tech world, what they've done is they've erased all of that past. They've erased all of that history. And so if you've read 1984, this idea of the memory hole that's talked about, right? George Orwell talks about things being thrown down the memory hole. That's literally what's happening with information. Fact checkers are a big part of that because the fact checkers don't actually, as I said, ever go back to source documentation for anything that they cover. Instead, what they'll do is they'll, they'll look at something that I do, like uh, you know, talking about the lab leak, and they'll say, oh, this is a lie. We, we, we're rating it as either misleading or false information. And then you look at why. And the reason they'll say why is because a letter was written to the Lancet signed by doctors saying it didn't come from there. Oh, well, but, but what do we know now? So what we know now about that letter that was written to the Lancet was a guy named Peter Daszak, who was the one who was actually funding the gain of function research based on the grants he received through Echo Health Alliance from Anthony Fauci and the NIH. He went out and he recruited doctors and got them to sign a letter that he wrote that said it didn't come from here. Right? The guy who was responsible for gain of function wrote a letter saying gain of function didn't happen and Wuhan lab had nothing to do with this. He got other scientists to sign it. And then that becomes a fact. Whereas as a journalist, I'm saying no, but you're saying that's a fact. Let me show you what actual facts are. Fact, here's a grant from the NIH specifically to Echo Health Alliance, which was conducting research according to that grant at the Wuhan lab in Wuhan, China. Here's a grant for gain of function research on bat coronaviruses, on spike proteins in bats. Here's Dr. Xi, here's her credentials. Here's what she said about the, the, the research they conducted. Here's the $40 million that the US government spent. Those are facts. When you have the source documentation, that's a fact. A letter some guy writes is not, but we're living in upside down town right now where, where what is true is false and what is false is true. And so it's very difficult for the average person because they see an authoritative source like USA Today, which is a joke, or they'll see PolitiFact, which is a joke, and they'll believe that these authoritative sources are telling them the truth because they just read the headline. You know, Wuhan lab responsible for coronavirus, false. Oh, okay, well, it's on USA Today, so it must be true. We've been trained to think that way, and I think a lot of people are waking up to it now. Thank you. Question. Hey, Ben. Hey. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to hear about your platform that you're rolling out, but have you given any, in, any consideration for the infrastructure behind that? I'm going to get a little geeky here for a second. Sure. But one of the things that I caution my friends that are, that are all talking about how, you know, Bitcoin and blockchain, that's the future because it's decentralized. I remind them a simple patch rolled out to servers and uh, network devices across the country could shut down all packets pertaining to Bitcoin overnight. Mm -hmm. So you develop your platform and I can see a day where they shut you down via the infrastructure. Have you given, have you or anybody that you're aware of given any thought into maybe competing with Cisco and Netgear and companies like that to start rolling out independent um, or independent you know, infrastructure related hardware. So we're, we're looking at doing that, but that's a more of a long-term strategy. In the short term, what we're doing is we're using I, uh, IPFS systems in order to decentralize all servers. So right now, 
where our content will be stored can't be targeted in one specific location because it's, it's a decentralized server system that we're building right now. So long-term, that may be, may be a strategy, but in the short term, we're keeping it as de decentralized as possible so that content is being stored in, in fractions really across the globe, if that answers you. You left, so I don't know if it answered you. <laughs> yes. <you>. Okay, <laughs> there you go. Cool. So the name of the platform is Sovereign, it's spelled S-O-V-R-E-N, and it plays off the idea that you as an individual young man, that you are sovereign in your ability to speak, in your belief system, in your ability to conduct your life, to travel, to move about, that you in this country, we have enshrined the idea that you have those rights and that government cannot take them away or impose upon them, that makes you a sovereign individual. So that's the name of our platform, is that you are sovereign. And each content creator and each person who comes to the site will have their own sovereign space. And sovereign spaces are built to be where you're able to keep information, store it. You can download information into it that you find online. You can post your own uh, pictures and memes and images, and it belongs to you. We do not keep it like Facebook does. We don't consider it our property. It belongs to you because it's your own sovereign space. Okay. What was your name, young man? Travis. Travis, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Good evening. So, hi, I'm Eliza, and I was wondering what we can do as a youth and as more common people to share what we believe, you know, in a safe and uh, respectful manner. Well, I think the first thing that you guys can do, very nice to meet you, by the way, Eliza. Uh, the first <laughs> thing I would say is that you need to stop believing. When, when somebody tells you, media tells you, a headline tells you, a social media post tells you, a meme tells you that something is true, you've got to stop assuming things are true because you need to stop seeing, um, you know, newspapers, online newspapers, um, TV broadcasts, local news. You need to stop seeing all of that as authoritative. And what you as young people need to do is begin to reject the idea that anyone is an authoritative voice and that everyone has equal ground. So your neighbor who tells you something, your parent who tells you something, or the local newscaster who tells you it, or the CEO of a tech company who tells you it, right? Nothing is true unless you can show me why it's true. And I think we need to have something called critical thinking come back into our society. And as young people, my hope is, so my, my kids are, how old are you? I'm 15. 15, okay, so you're, you're the same age as one of my sons. I have a son who's 17, I have a daughter who's 20, a daughter who's 21, and a son who's 13, right? So right about you guys' ages. And what I hope for their generation is that they become a generation of critical thinkers, and that's what they do. They criticize every bit of information. Where is it coming from? Show me where it came from. And if you can't, then I don't listen to you, right? And so um, we used to have a concept of, of trusted authority built into our society. You could turn on the news, now this is before my time, but there was a guy named Walter Cronkite, right? I never really saw him, I was, I'm too young for that. But some of you might know who Walter Cronkite is. And he was the guy that when you turned on the news at nighttime, people trusted him because he sat behind an anchor desk and he told you the truth. That was the idea. We don't live in that world anymore. And so what we need is a world of critical thinkers who don't just have an opinion because that's the cool thing to have right now, but who, be know why they believe what they believe. And so what I would encourage you in is become educated on the things that you're interested in, become educated on the world around you. And the more you know, the less you're reliant on someone else to tell you what is true and what is not. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. My, my name is Jackson Whipple. Uh, I was recently at Boy State. You may have heard of that. If anybody's interested, you can talk to me about it. <laughs> um, I, we, one of the speakers that came 
was we were on an army base so someone came and talked to us about warfare a different type so there's like conventional warfare and biological you know that they're making a new kind of warfare like cybernetics warfare where you can like drop a bomb and it interferes with the signals and stuff yeah so it makes your planes invisible the scanners it just mm-hmm. things like that. um what what are your thoughts on that what do you how do you think it may apply to your social media platform Well, I I think it's definitely on its way, right? The idea that in the future, pretty much all warfare will become cyber warfare. In fact, I think part of what we need to do as a society, this is separate from media, as a society is we need to become less reliant on on, uh, AI systems, artificial intelligence. I know the world wants to go that way and tech companies want to go that way. We actually need to be going the opposite direction, right? Saying uh, we have too much reliance on it. And, and a great example of that is the whole colonial pipeline shutdown, which by the way, is kind of garbage because colonial shut down their own pipeline, hackers did not. But in theory, hackers could have done it. In theory, they didn't. Um, but in terms of our platform and how it affects us, look, we, we believe that um, a huge part of what we will spend our time each day doing is fighting off cyber attacks against what we're doing uh, and the attempt to, to navigate and control and dominate language on our platform. Uh, and, and really to co-opt our platform in a lot of ways. So we believe that that will be the case. In our case, what we're really working to do is build it beyond ourselves. Um, part of our goal is to actually launch our platform as a centralized leadership, decentralized technology platform that eventually will become a decentralized governance and decentralized technology. Decentralized governance means there won't be a CEO running the company. In the future, I'm right now, I'm the CEO, I won't be. In the future, there will be nobody in charge of it that the, it will just belong to the people. That is the goal here. And to create the first ever DAO, Decentralized Autonomous Organization, first ever DAO Republic, where people will, instead of fact checkers and moderators, will actually elect representatives who will have the ability to protect the site from having harmful content. When I say harmful, I'm talking about things like child pornography or murder videos, terrible things that we do not believe should be on the platform but that we'll also have a constitution that protects content creators so that those moderators or representatives cannot remove content that has the right to be there. So we're actually trying to model the US, this US system of governance the way it was originally designed by our founders to create a social platform that becomes a global platform and is no longer controlled by any one person or entity. So uh, I'm sure we'll have a lot of attacks for that, <laughs> but. That's, that's where we're headed with it. We're going to do something nobody else has ever done before. Hopefully it'll work, but we'll find out. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Hello, my name is Zach. I am 18 years old and I have a question for you. All right. I have heard, well, I've encountered several other social media platforms. You mentioned Parler, yep. Gab, uh, Rumble. Uh, there's few other alternatives like PeerTube and whatnot that I've heard of. Yes. And from what I've heard and seen, they all have fairly, uh, there's a fairly small amount of people who are actually know about that sort of stuff and even fewer who actually try that sort of stuff. That's so right. You're, so from what I've heard and seen, you're already working with a very diminished audience that That's you right. can appeal to. So how do you plan on setting yourself apart from the rest of the competition and or expanding your people that you can be? That's, that's a really great question. Um, so a couple of things. One is that you're right. Th- there are already a limited number of people and it's a fractured space. One thing that makes us very different than these other sites like Parler and Rumble, um, I think Frank's speech is another one. Um, Dave Rubin's doing something called Locals. There are a lot of them out there. The problem is all of them have centralized technology so they can all be taken down at any time. So that's one thing that makes us a little bit different. But also because of how we're setting up a governance system wherein we're allowing for this this DAO that eventually takes control and that each content creator is protected by a constitution. Uh, We have been working with some big name content creators who have huge followings in other places. And we're organizing for all of them to come over kind of simultaneously and do an exit from those other social media platforms. And so a lot of just, if we're talking about from the uh, business standpoint, what makes you different, what makes it work? What makes it work is bringing the right people. If the right content creators come over and have large audiences, their audiences follow them to those locations. The other thing that, that creates the opportunity 
is that when you combine those content creators with a really terrific UX UI, do you know that term? User experience, user interface, you know, blockchain developers and engineers are super smart people. I mean, freaky smart people, uh, but they're not necessarily into con uh, content design, right? <laughs> they don't really understand the design part. It's like two worlds, two parts of the brain working. And so we have an amazing team of designers who are actually designing the site. A lot of it has to do with how easy is the site to use? How, how intuitive is that site? So we, we're accomplishing both of those things. Well, as I said, bringing in the right content creators, that'll make a huge difference. Good question, though. Smart stuff. What sort of content creators will you be bringing over? So I don't want to say on this video because we're being recorded, uh, but you'll be seeing their names popping up very soon. Very soon. Okay. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Ben, we'd really like to thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to be talking uh, this afternoon uh, to a local radio Christian station about a cyber attack that was on them last fall. Wow. Um, he was actually sitting at his desk when he looked up at his computer and saw the cursor moving and pulling files out of his folders. Wow. And so that happened here in Idaho. And we're, we will be talking about alternatives. So we would like to keep in touch with you about what you're doing. It's very exciting. And we really thank God for you and appreciate all that you've done and all that you're doing. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye.